Pope Summers is the muted messiah, and Exodus will be the first pope which her church will be built upon, just like Peter for the Nazarene mutant. Back in April, Immortal X-Men issue number one featured this comic panel that sparked some outrage at the fact that Marvel was implying that Jesus was a mutant. Immortal X-Men issue five doubles down on that claim with this X-Men tie-in comic to the Axe Judgment Day storyline. Let's take a read of the comic panel. They are dragons hope. What do you think I'm going to do? I am the Pope of the new church like Peter was long ago. Peter was a rock upon which a Nazarene mutant built his church. Yes, I am that rock, but I am also the rock in the hand of Cain. As we highlighted in our X-Men vs the Antichrist video, which I highly recommend you check out after watching this video, Kyron Gillen stated in a CBS article that Exodus is an Omega level mutant if there ever was one and has a long history deeply rooted in religion. He's Catholic, Gillen previously said of the X-Men character. I was raised Catholic, so my Catholicism is all over the place. I like how he has his own warped mutant take on Catholicism. I'm not sure how deep I'll go into the concept of anti-popes and such, but I might. Exodus is about the weirdness of being a believer. And Karen went deep with this issue and we are going to break it down from a Christian perspective. But before we get into that, if you are enjoying the video thus far and your jaw dropped during the intro like mine when I first heard and read that comic panel, then please consider leaving a like on the video and subscribe for more fictional media breakdowns from a Christian perspective. Did you do it yet? I'll give you two seconds. Thanks if you did. <laughs> Buckle up because it's going to be a ride. On this channel, we cover fictional media from a full Bible-believing Christian perspective in full context. So let's explain what exactly led to that comic panel as well as taking a look at other panels I believe are noteworthy to highlight. This comic is the fifth issue of the Immortal X-Men comic line and the first X-Men tie-in comic of the Axe Judgment Day event. The Axe Judgment Day event is a crossover event between the Avengers, the X-Men and the Eternals, hence Axe A-X-E. The official synopsis on the Marvel Wiki goes, The X-Men have achieved immortality and mutants have taken their place as the dominant species on the planet. The Eternals have discovered long-hidden knowledge about their species, including a devastating truth about mutant kind. The Avengers have come into conflict with the Celestials and are currently using a fallen Celestial as their base of operations, slowly unlocking its secrets. When the Eternals brazenly target the mutant nation of Kakoa, the Avengers are trying desperately to de-escalate a potential apocalyptic war. But this is no simple conflict. The Eternals' purpose cannot be denied and mutant kind's future will not be threatened. And after the opening battles, new players and revelations from both sides will emerge as the inhabitants of the Marvel Universe are judged by the greatest power they've ever come into contact with. The first issue of Axe kicked off with the Eternals making their first strike against the X-Men by sending the Unimind to wage psychic warfare against the mutants targeting their leaders, mainly the Quiet Council, because they know if they cripple the leaders, the soldiers ain't got no one to give them orders. The X-Men go into full defense mode and defend the homeland of Kakoa. However, something bad happened on Oroko, the mutant colony on Mars, which leads to the death and urgent resurrection of of cable. At the same time, the Eternals use the Unimind to cripple the leaders of mutant kind on Kakoa. They also unleash Uranus the Undying on Araku, the mutant colony on Mars. He completely destroyed everyone like he kills all 1 million of the mutants on Mars. But the X-Men are immortal, so the key war leaders are brought back through the rituals of the Five. The Five are five mutants whose powers when combined are able to resurrect all dead mutants. They then place urgency on bringing back all the mutants who were killed on Araku. The Eternals know about the Five, so the mission was to kill them immediately, but the first strike fails. The Eternals then warn the Earth of what is about to go down, as they send their second strike, the Hexes, some beasts that rise right out of the sea. 
ready to lay waste to Kakoa. At the same time, Ajak and Makari Eternals who don't want any part of the war carry Mr. Sinister who they kidnapped stating that with his help they are going to be able to turn the tide of the battle and they need Iron Man's help to make a god and I quote directly from the comic panel, this is a holy war born of holy scripture a god can rewrite the scripture and end the war help us build our god this is where fiction has arrived to in 2022 it is no longer just about cool sci-fi tech with superhumans and superheroes and advanced technology we are talking about holy wars and rewriting holy scripture but then again it's just fiction, right? The Book of Exodus, which is the official tagline of the Immortal X-Men number 5, kicks off with Bene Duparis walking through the desert, narrating a memory of his time as a Templar Knight. To you, apocalypse means the end of the world. You have insufficient learning. Apocalypse means revelation. Revelation is a way of seeing, and in that desert, I saw clearly for the first time. You'd likely say I was hallucinating, but then I taught myself a man of faith. Was it Moses' burning bush? Was it akin to Constantine's vision of the true cross? Somehow both, something else. As a man of faith, I had no answers. But now, as a mutant of faith, I understand perfectly. Exodus's birth name was Bennett to Paris. He lived during the 12th century AD as a Templar Knight to the Crusades. The Crusades were a series of religious wars initiated, supported, and sometimes directed by the Latin Church in the medieval period. The best known of the Crusades are those to the Holy Lands in the period between 1095 and 1291 that were intended to recover Jerusalem and its surrounding area from Islamic rule. Beginning with the First Crusade, which resulted in the recovery of Jerusalem in 1099. Dozens of Crusades were fought, providing a focal point of European history for centuries. What he is saying has some truth to it when it comes to the word apocalypse, which in our Apocalypse Explained video we mentioned. The word apocalypse comes from the Greek word apocalypse. I know a butcher in the Greek, which means uncovering, a derivative of the verb apocalyptian, which means to take the cover off. I know a butcher that word as well. According to dictionary.com, the earliest recorded meaning of apocalypse in all English was in reference to the name of the last book in the New Testament, also called Revelation. It recounts several prophetic visions of upheaval and destruction culminating in the second coming of Christ. In Middle English, apocalypse was extended to mean any revelation or disclosure. However, the meaning any disaster or cataclysm was not recorded until the late 19th century. Now the parts about Constantine's visions and the true cross. The person I'm talking about is Emperor Constantine of Rome. Constantine is blamed for many things. People say, Constantine created that Bible you're reading. Or, Constantine created Christianity at the Council of Nicaea. Look it up. And many other things. Today, he will be discussed as Constantine moved toward battle with Maxentius at the Milvian Bridge outside of Rome. He is claimed to have gone through some sort of religious experience. Eusebius tells of a vision seen by Constantine in which the Christian sign of a cross appeared in the sky with the legend saying, in hoc signu vine, or in this sign, conquer. So he had the cross put on his legion's shields. He easily defeated Maxentius, who fled back to Rome. But before reaching the city, Maxentius fell into the river and drowned. His body was discovered the next morning among the corpses of many others. Now you are free to check out the links in the description to gain a better understanding of Constantine and the events of the midi the midi medieval church <laughs> i'm putting a pin on that and continuing along with exodus's backstory he came upon the phoenix in the desert and being a man of faith he believed he was having his own moses and the burning bush experience he later met apocalypse who awakens his dormant mutant powers and enhanced them to its fullest potential an event he states that revealed his blessing and shattered his understanding of the world he became an apostle a herald, an acolyte, but it came at a cost. I just had to kill the man who was closer to me than a brother. 
Bennett then who had a brawl with the Black Knight Garrathon and the Eternal Cersei. Context to this, these two are the same characters from the end of the Eternals movie. In the comics, they travel back in time from the 21st century to the 13th century attempting to do a time jump that went wrong. Dane Whitman finds his spirit in the body of Garrington. His consciousness is however buried under Garrington's. Cersei is forced to pass Garrington's soul onto the next plane with his permission of course because that's important. <laughs> to restore Whitman's consciousness. In the brawl, Bennett refuses to kill Garrington and Apocalypse judges him as weak. He proceeds to attack Apocalypse with the panel dialogue narrating, I was still in the desert and was being tempted by the devil. Let Jesus reference. Do not take this to mean simple hate. Hate is a small thing. I hate many. There is only one devil. To be the devil is a compliment. Satan is the adversary and the adversary plays a part. Apocalypse may be vile, but he is core to my religion. Still, he is smaller than I taught him then. He did it all for his family. I snare. A mutant of faith thinks of a bigger family. But I am aware of the irony. He challenged me to kill a human whom I loved and I rejected him for it. God moves in mysterious ways. Some of those ways the movement of the ebony blade. We get a little Abraham and Isaac reference along with Duparis renouncing Apocalypse as a false god. Apocalypse defeats Duparis and puts him in a state of suspended animation. Out of the respect for his ancestor's friend, with Duparis, Whitman organizes an order of knights to guard Duparis' body, which they do through the ages until he is found and retrieved by Magneto. Because of the encounter with Cersei, present the Exodus whose mind is under siege by the psychic attack of the Unimind as he is a leader on the Choir Council, realizes that the attack is being done by the Eternals. The attack is trying to lose them in their own memories and he must wake up. However, he slipped into another memory of when Magneto awakened him from his slumber 800 years from the day he was put to slumber by Apocalypse. I'm very of the script and I don't want to start my recording. <laughs> he was perplexed by the new world and because of Magneto's act towards him, he thought of him as his messiah. I was in a tomb and he rolled back the rock and let me breathe. Jesus reference. In time, I realized he is but a mutant prophet, but it gave me time to learn and assemble my faith. Let me explain. Do you know of popes and antipopes? When there are two people who claim to be pope, one is the antipope. The one not recognized by the church is the antipope. That's it. The church could flip tomorrow and all popes become antipopes and vice versa. All it requires is the church to have a certain insight, a revelation. I am the only true church because I am a mutant and my journey has shown the cross from another angle. I saw the hidden meaning the humans did not and could not understand. An X is a rotated cross. There is a cross in the genes of every single mutant. All mutants carry the cross. Are you hearing this stuff? Like for real, literally, it's insane. These are the characters and dialogue pieces people like to mention making lists about top 5 Christian characters in fiction and asking why aren't you guys happy with the clear Christian characters in fiction? What Christian characters? The ones saying the Our Father in one scene and giving their bodies to be used by magic gods and sorcerers? Or like Exodus who is a mutant of faith who is blatantly looking for the Antichrist. I know I sound like, a, like some kind of cynical crazy Christian right now but I mean come on now what what Christian characters? This is like so far removed from, from what I would consider a Christian character. Like this is <laughs> getting heated. Continuing, I just want to apologize for the little um tapping song you were hearing that my desk was uneven but I fixed it now so let's continue. The comics continues by detailing Exodus's realization that Magneto was too flawed to be the messiah. What blasphemy has occurred Exodus says as he awakens due to Professor X's psychic barrier over the minds of the choir council and everyone who was under siege by the Unimind attack. 
Wolverine relays to them what really happened as they were paralyzed by the Eternals and they tried to go after the five and states they killed Egg and nearly killed Hope. It's time for war and Emma Frost is ready to launch a telepathic strike force upon the Eternals and tells Hope to copy Exodus's gift and links their minds. In a shared mindscape, Hope answers saying the following that I'll let you read it for yourself. Pause the video. Yeah, a sweary messiah. <laughs> the dialogue continues with Exodus narrating, Telepathy, like a revelation, is like seeing. To be truly powerful, I must see the conflict from terms I can understand. I am a knight, we are in a desert, and on my left hand is a diamond shield. For all our barbs, Emma is protective. She would not wish the children hurt, and faith is the sword in a knight's hand. In my strong right hand, my faith is hope, and the many-headed beast of the Eternals is a dragon. Now, this sequence is how Exodus imagined and interpreted the events to go on from his perspective as a mutant of fate. It's how we saw it in his head. Because they weren't actually fighting something in the physical. They were actually in their mind, within the astral plane, spiritual world. We dealt with that in our telepathy explained from a Christian perspective video. Yes, they were fighting in the spiritual world. That's where telepaths go to have all their kind of uh, telepathic battles. But I want to ask you. What scriptures were you able to pull out from that little piece that I just read about the shield and stuff? Let me know in the comments. Just a little activity. And if you can't pull out anything, don't worry. I'll be covering it in a little bit. Continuing along, we see the attack and the Unimind's response, but from the perspective of binary code. Weak, I cannot fail. I was so low. I have been lower. There were 200 mutants alive. The rest were wiped out by the Red Witch, Scarlet Witch for those who like one the context. We were a chosen people, seemingly chosen to sicken and die. I was on a pilgrimage seeking purpose. I found nothing. As I lightly touched on in our X-Men vs the Antichrist video, after the Scarlet Witch cast the spell No More Mutants, all of surviving mutant kind was destroyed. Exodus then flew himself into the sun only to realize that his mutant abilities were so powerful that he could not die. He stayed there for a good while, but it seems as though when Hope returned from the future, he felt it as with every powerful mutant did. And it brought him back to his time in the desert when he encountered the phoenix and had his Moses and the burning bush experience. A child had been born, the first since the witch swept us away. The child would return. The phoenix child would save us all. I was right. My messiah returned and the people kindled. I will never kneel as long as she stands. We then cut back to the present where Exodus is told to get up by hope as he had collapsed from the fight against the Eternals which he perceived as a fight against a multi-headed dragon. They begin to celebrate but it is short-lived as the Eternals were now sending the hexes that we saw earlier with the message to all of earth who actually rejoiced at the fact that the eternals their protectors quote unquote were going to kill the x-men yeah people were like happy and rejoicing about that six beings of such scale attacked our sacred land hope says they are not ready for that battle to which exodus tells her we are retired to safety and return the fallen warriors to the field Get the five, start to resurrect as much people as possible because it's going to be a war. That is basically what it means. Be an inspiration. Guard the flame of mutant life. Be yourself. It's more than sufficient. And this is where the lines I read at the beginning of the video fit into everything. Exodus responds, they are dragon hope. What do you think I'm going to do? I am the Pope of a new church like Peter was long ago. Peter was a rock upon which the Nazarene mutant built his church. Yes, I am that rock, but I am also the rock in the hand of Cain. The comic ends with Exodus seemingly about to go to town on the hexes. A shot that I cannot deny even with all the biblical twistings and madness that this book was filled with looks amazing. One of the most common objections we receive in regards to this type of content is it's just fiction. As if we don't know that, it obviously is. We're not saying there's a magic wizard trying to mend space and time or 
some endless being called dream that controls all dreams in the universe that's not what we're saying from there it's a twist of our words to things like how weak is your faith that watching play or reading blank will make you doubt it a statement that quite frankly can only be made by people who don't even actually watch the video they are commenting under but still have decided to leave a comment because if they did watch the video and still commented that we leave that chain of thought right there and I have no problem with that. Keep leaving your comments once it is done with no swearing, as it does actually help out the channel. Our Sandman video is loaded with comments showing that people didn't actually watch the video at all because they maybe just saw the hook and made their comment or they probably just saw the title and made their comment. The video even got massive dislike bombed, but it is also one of our highest impression videos on the channel. And I personally don't classify these actions as a form of hate or persecution. In starting the channel a year ago, I told my theological advisors that if the videos don't get any form of contention, then we ain't doing it right. And it's not because I want to be some Christian keyboard warrior doing 15 reply chains with viewers sending scriptures to atheists and stuff. It ain't none of that. That's not what it's about. But it's a matter of the state of fictional media has reached a perfect illustration of 2 Timothy 4 from verse 3 to 4 which says for the time is coming when people will not endure song teaching but having itching ears they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths the actual context of this scripture is in relation to christians within the church being led astray by false teachers within the church but in covering fictional media from a christian perspective i like to apply teachers in this verse to also represent comic writers authors, actors, directors, and a lot of people in fictional media. They are the teachers that a lot of Christians and by extension non-Christians accumulate to suit their own passions. And these guys know, and this is one of my favorite clips to run in relation to this particular topic. Some amazing uh, question or just for all of us really popped in my head that day as being fans or creators and artists and creative people that make comics and make movies and make all sorts of things. So, you know, when he was saying that um, um, we look to these superheroes to, to, to get our, our, our moral code and our integrity and our courage, we actually use them as a basis. And then it made me think, well, if, if that's the case, and it actually is, like pop culture is actually the new mythology. So um, if that's the case, like what a crazy power that any of us wield. Um, <coughs> I had described it to him as it's almost like you're doing an ongoing series of the Bible that people are like getting this moral code from. And through these comics, these humanists, atheists, and God haters, and really Maltheists when we talk about it today, are ultimately pushing narratives that will put doubt into your heads, doubt into young people's heads over and over again as Satan continues to use them to attack the mind. And we need to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And I must admit, I do quite overuse that clip in our videos. Karen Gillan knows exactly what he was doing with Exodus in the comic. He did allude to it a good while ago, stating, I'm not sure how deep I'll go into the concept of anti-popes and stuff, but I might. Exodus is about the weirdness of being a believer. And he did go deep because you cannot make such brilliant twists like this by simply only knowing a little piece of the Bible or going off of atheist memes trying to debunk Christians with terms like God is the same as a flying spaghetti monster. And I don't say brilliant because I agree with it. I don't. I said brilliant because it is done in such a way that many would look at this and think, oh, that's a cool interpretation and interjection of the Christian faith into the X-Men. As a result, there was no outrage compared to Immortal X-Men number 2 when they initially implied that Jesus was a mutant. Now, let me state one time, people complaining about it most times won't work, especially in these cases, after all, it's just fiction to many. But for me, as a Christian who understands the significance of the scriptures being twisted, I mean in this one they straight up name drop Peter as the rock upon which Jesus built his church on. For those of you who don't understand exactly why this is such a significant scripture, I'll roll this clip from our What If Ultron Explained video. 
On this rock, I will build my church is taken from Matthew 16 verse 18. In our video, we stated that in the movie, this can have several interpretations. Ultron using vibranium and parts of the device to literally lift the church and the area he was operating from into the sky. Ultron using the vibranium to create his new body and the body of the vision. Through the use of vibranium, Ultron was going to be able to fully enact his plan to wipe out all humans and reduce the world to nothing but metal and in parallel to the biblical context, where the scripture context is as follows. During Jesus' ministry, the people of the land began speculating who Jesus might be. Some said he was John the Baptist, some said Elijah, and others said Jeremiah or one of the prophets from the Old Testament of the Bible. But Simon bar -Jonah, Peter, responded, You are the living Christ, the Son of the living God. The significance of his response is that this information had not yet been revealed to anyone as yet. Jesus didn't tell them who he was or what his mission was. So Peter, which is the name Simon bar -Jonah, was renamed to by Jesus himself recorded in John 1.42 which says, Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter was given this knowledge by none other than God the Father, which is referenced in verse 17 where Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon bar -Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Where flesh and blood in this context are referring to no human being. Now the meaning of Peter is where it gets tied together. The word Peter comes from the Greek word Petros, which means rock, and Cephas also means rock in Aramaic. The interpretation of verse 18 is one of the most crucial yet debated New Testament scriptures as its main premise is that when Jesus said, and I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church, he meant that upon this revelation and knowledge that Jesus Christ as the son of the living God, Peter was the only one up to this point acquired at this capacity of professing Jesus Christ as the son of the living God will be the foundation upon which the church that has not been formed as yet at this point in scripture will be built on. In issue number 2 which I just found out and didn't see when I made the initial video covering what was said in issue 1 a couple weeks ago after Hope gets back from running an assassination mission on Celine, Hope says to Exodus, I hope you realize I'm not the Messiah. Jesus didn't shoot anyone through the head. He did not. This is another reason why you're a far superior messiah, messiah. What? But then again, it's just fiction, right? I know I referenced the video we did on X-Men vs the Antichrist a lot in this video, where that Antichrist we are referring to in that video is Nate Gray from the 2018 Age of X-Men storyline, which is a video I highly recommend you check out because it does a lot of heavy lifting when it comes to the Antichrist depiction vs a Jesus parallel in fictional media. This comic, if I were to rename it, will be Immortal X-Men number 5 preparing you for the Antichrist. And yeah, I know I'm venturing into cinema christian territory but i mean that's where we have reached iron man is building a new god to rewrite holy scripture to end a holy war we are no longer dealing with throwaway quips and jokes and biblical undertones it's straight out name drops of jesus reducing him to nothing more than a mere mutant and i can guarantee he was not an omega level mutant which is one of the most powerful classes of mutants raising people from the dead in the x-men mythos is something that seemed like a you know high power but I'm pretty sure just like with in issue 1 where, they, where Exodus asks did the Holy Spirit come upon you I'm pretty sure if they were ever to introduce Jesus and I will not be surprised given the state of fiction right now they might bring back Jesus and Negro some madness like that if, if I ever see a comic like that it would be a field day for explanations but yeah I'm pretty sure like if you the British much wouldn't portray him as an all-powerful type of being because they raised another messiah in his place and on his quest to find that messiah exodus accidentally raised false gods and prophets into that place it is no longer like it was a few years back when i could have called these things biblical undertones and in order to spot them you had to really know know what the bible says in order to see these types of twists because what we are seeing now is straight out scripture quoting and twisting. 
on the next level. At times, it's not even a case of twisting the scriptures because, if we are being honest, these comic writers are interpreting the book of Revelation into the comic material more accurately than a lot of Christians and pastors that we have come across on the internet and even in our personal life. Now, I'm not praising these authors for the way they pull from scripture I, that is not what i'm doing i don't want you to get the wrong impression of what i mean as they're twisting and straight or blatant disregard and disrespect of scripture outweighs the amount of times they adopt the scriptures into the material without twisting it let's take a look at the little activity i gave you guys a while back which i hope some of you did when exodus was about to head into battle with a shield in his left hand and a sword in his right well what i could have connected that to was a play on the armor of god from ephesians 6 verse 10 to 18 where he has the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit the dragon he imagined being a play on revelations 12 verse 3 to 4 and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Though the dragon Exodus depicted himself to be fighting did not have seven heads and was green, the Unimind is actually the merging of two or more Eternals. And during the current Prime Eternal who commands the war against the X-Men, talked to the Great Council depicted as red beings who agreed to his plan and are the ones who formed the Unimind. However, according to the panels, there are only six Red Eternals and Drig the Commander. So, because of this and the fact that we are getting a bit into the more gymnastic territory of trying to draw parallels, I'd rather assign them to the first six of the seven seals as well, which we see in Revelation chapter 6. And this is because simultaneously with the Unimind laying psychic siege on the telepathic X-Men, the Eternals send forth the first strike of foot soldiers, an attack fleet outfitted with war armor from the earliest days. When I saw this, my mind drew to the locust that will be unleashed with the commencing of the fifth angel blowing his trumpet detailed in Revelation 9. The fifth angel was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. Skip it to verse 7, it describes their appearance like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like woman's hair and their teeth like lion's teeth, their breastplates like breastplates of iron and the noise of their wings like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions. I know the first strike team does not fit perfectly into this description. As a matter of fact, nothing does as we are quite frankly doing some gymnastics to draw parallels given the context of the comic. This, the whole thing with the locusts, to me, as a Marvel fan, more closely can be aligned with the Annihilation Wave, given what the Annihilation Wave represents in Marvel Comics to what the locusts represent in the Bible. And I know someone may have been saying by now, dude, this stuff sounds just as much fiction as Marvel. How could anybody hold this as true or believe it? And if any of you are having that thought, just hold on. We'll get to that very shortly. When Exodus charged against the Hex, I couldn't help but draw a link to the war in heaven with Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, where they ultimately defeat the ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, who was the deceiver of the whole world. However, it is inverted, where instead of Michael in this case being the Eternals who are enacting righteous judgment upon the X-Men, Hope is the messiah of the mutants and they are her church. Exodus charging into battle is Michael who defeats Satan and this is so ironic because the origin story of the Eternals, Gods, the Celestials is the complete twisting of this exact scripture where instead of Michael and his angels winning the battle, Satan and his angels win the battle and banish God and his angels out of the universe. We covered this in the very first video we made on this channel covering the Marvel creation story behind the Eternals and the Celestials.
The last thing I want to highlight is Exodus's explanation of how the mutants bear the cross in their DNA. In the Bible, there are five instances of where we learn about the seal of God, which are John 6 verse 27, 2 Timothy 2 verse 9, Revelation 6 verse 9, chapter 7 verse 2, and chapter 9 verse 4. The latter of the two scriptures, Revelation 7 verse 3 to 4 and 9 verse 4, refer to a group of people who have the seal of God and thus his protection during the tribulation. During the fifth trumpet judgment, which is the one where the locusts are unleashed on the earth, we saw that they are told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. The seal of God during the tribulation is the direct opposite of the mark of the beast, which identifies people as followers of Satan as seen in Revelation 13 verse 16 to 18, which says, Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. We are all too familiar with the mark of the beast and many interpretations surrounding it, especially with what we went through in the past year when people stated all kinds of things. But we are not going to go there. Let's link it back to the comic. The main reason for the war between the X-Men and the Eternals is based according to the Eternals Holy Scripture and their three principles. Number three of those principles is to get rid of all excess deviations. When the Celestials, the creators of the entire Marvel Universe, went on to create life throughout the galaxy, they chose the most dominant species on a particular planet and split it into three groups. The Eternals, an everlasting and cosmically empowered race, the Deviants, a more genetically unstable and constantly changing group, and the Baseline group is given the latent potential that would be realized later. At a DNA level, the Eternals bear the mark of the literal gods of the universe in their DNA and are set out as the protectors of the rest of the species from the Deviants. For thousands of years, because of the ability for the baseline race to gain superpowers due to the latent gene within them, the Eternals didn't view the mutants and the X-Gene as a threat, because in their minds, they thought it was just the awakening of the dormant gene everyone has in them. However, when the mutants gained immortality, something that according to the Eternals, by the very natural order of the universe and according to Holy Scripture, is reserved for them alone, they realized that the X gene, which is the special gene found in mutants that gives them their power, was a deviation. It simply means, and I quote, Correct excess deviation, of a third principle. For a million years, we've done that. Earth has been protected from the deviants, but we made a mistake. We missed one, the mutants. Their X gene came from the deviants. They are not human. They are deviants. So they fall under our watch purview. They have escaped the great machine that is Earth and colonized Mars. Worse, they have escaped their chains of death itself. Their deviation will go on forever. This is excess deviation. It must be corrected. Let me bring fire and death to those whom it's our eternal duty to correct. Now I hope I haven't lost you because we are landing the plane right here. The X-Men are written by default as atheists. They don't believe in God or any gods because of the power within them. But whenever we get a Christian mutant, they are usually turned all the way up to 50 on a scale of 10. We initially had Nightcrawler who has since long abandoned his faith in the Christian God for mutant kind. To replace him, we have Exodus who is wrestling with faith, knows firmly that Jesus is not the Messiah and firmly believes hope is his Messiah. Messiah, even if she rejects it. Exodus views the X gene akin to the significance of what we as Christians believe what it means to be born again believers. Something that non believers just won't understand and will call us cynical people who imagine things and shape our life around a fictional book from 2000 years ago filled with errors and has been used to justify all sorts of atrocities. A book that a growing number of people are rejecting, banning, and developing a great resentment towards. 
said book and the people who believe in it so much so that people can fake an outrage stating that these people said this when they never said that which will end up leading to everyone spilling out their resentment towards those people referring to the christians against miss marvel facebook group that no christian was in that group that actually said any of those things but people were like you see this is my problem with christianity no one tried to fact check it everyone was like yeah christians are dumb they would say dumb stuff like this so etc it was the, it was sad the channel even got caught up with our christian preview to miss marvel video getting reviewed <laughs> it got dislike bombed all kinds of comments stating things that we never said in the video a fellow christian youtuber who does this similar type of content was in there defending some of the stuff that we said against people who literally didn't watch the video but made comments and stuff it was all kinds of stuff was going on and the funny thing about it is this is something that the very book itself predicts will happen especially in the last days in the comic exodus stated an x is a rotated cross there is a cross in the genes of every single mutant all mutants carry the cross exodus views mutant kind as god's chosen people who have finally found the messiah who without a shadow of a doubt was not jesus while the actual chosen people of the gods of the marvel universe view them akin to what the bible views those who bear the mark of the beast people who have decided to show their rejection for god's word and the way of life in the greatest way possible are you understanding what these panels are stating? If you are a Christian that can watch all of this and still say it's just fiction, then I must be blunt and state, you are one of the Christians that 2 Timothy 4.3 is talking about. People who will not endure song teaching but have an itching ears will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And I don't mean that in malice because I'm not some high and mighty Christian watching down under the saying, hmm, look at how they are lost christians and being stupid couldn't be me no i was like you fictional media was my escape i bought all the figurines possible went to see all the movies and binged as much information about these fictional universes that my brain could have handled anyone who tried to tell me that these things were bad i could have justified and put them in the place as to why they were wrong and being cynical christians along with showing them how marvel and dc were given honor and reverence to God all because I did not know what the word of God said many Christians believe in the Bible they love Jesus with all their heart but they have no discernment because they never read the Bible and when they do it's really fluff passages about Jesus loves you and you know the gentle Jesus meek and mild you know like you have to get into the word what the word says is important and the whole word not just pieces and parts of the words that you want to hold and be like oh that, uh, that part hurts like no you have to get into the full word especially if you want to say you are a bible believing christian that's what is required of us because it's evident and really easy to point out those who are at the peak of the no competence but full of confidence side of the dunning kruger effect graph if we were to apply it to christians who are in love with fiction and once again i don't say this from a high and mighty place i tell people i know personally that i know the bible but i don't know the word fully i'm currently embarking on my journey of reading the bible from cover to cover for the first time in my life and writing my own personal commentary as i go along but the dunning kruger effect graph shows a cognitive bias whereby people with a limited knowledge or competence in a given intellectual or social domain greatly overestimate their knowledge or competence in that domain relative to objective criteria while in contrast people who are more experienced with a higher level of knowledge and competence on a subject greatly underestimate themselves to apply it to the case of christian themes in fiction those who are of no competent side of the graph are quick to keyboard warrior anyone who speaks against their favorite pieces of fiction and will say all kinds of things stating they know the bible they know what it says they know what jesus will want of them jesus knows their heart don't judge me etc while saying things that are completely opposite to what the word of god says at every corner and comes up with some of the funniest fallacy filled arguments ever and will closely align themselves with authors who made a career making fiction centered around brilliantly twisting and refuting the word of god 
brilliant in their own eyes but a fool in the eyes of God. And Christians would justify their content by saying, dude, it's just fiction. Whereas on the contrary, we have people who firmly understand that they don't know everything, but they know enough to see the deception, don't deny that what they are watching is fiction, because it obviously is, but also knowing that it is fiction hell-bent on twisting the word of God. Something that the last verses of the Bible states, I warn everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in his book. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Amen. And with quoting the final verses of the Bible, I think it's a perfect place to end off this video. So with that being said, to those of you who have watched this part of the video, I am thankful for each and every one of you who took the time to listen to what I have to say. And you know, get passionate. It's not that I get angry, it's just that I get like really passionate, especially in regards to how fiction twists the word of God. I know this video was long, it's over 40 minutes and this page is over 9, <laughs> this word document is over 9 pages. I do plan on covering more of the Axe Judgment Day series in the future because at this point, fictional media, especially Marvel's newer comic lines, are the hand that keeps giving for my style of content. So if you enjoyed the video, then please leave a like on the video as it helps out the channel a lot and gets these videos in front of other people who may be thinking these things are actually glorifying God when they are not and if there's anything that you were a bit confused on in the video because i as i stated with the book of revelations it's really hard to condense things there's some there's some things that i was doing like gymnastics are wrong so if you have any questions you can let me know in the comments and i will get back to it and if you would like to see our continued breakdowns of the axe judgment day event as well as other fictional media breakdowns from a christian perspective then be sure to subscribe with post notifications and hit that bell but in subscribing remember these videos are not to tell you what you can and cannot watch read or play but it's so that you simply no longer blindly consume.